After years of tireless advocacy from people with endometriosis, the condition is slowly coming into sharper focus with a surge in research that could radically change our understanding of the condition and how to treat it. In this two-part video, I'm summarizing some of the recent endometriosis research, what these studies mean for the future of endometriosis, and how and if we can apply these findings to managing and treating endometriosis today. Stick around to learn more. The most recent endometriosis research has been focused on diagnostic innovations, i.e. making diagnosis of endometriosis more accessible, the genetic basis for endometriosis, the bacteria endometriosis connection, and non-hormonal anti-inflammatory medications as a treatment for the disease. I'll be posting new videos here on YouTube every week, so be sure to subscribe and follow along. Let's jump in. The endo micro RNA saliva test is a multi-center external validation study testing the validity and accuracy of the Zoig endo test in diagnosing endometriosis. They used micro RNAs, which stands for ribonucleic acids derived from saliva. Micro ribonucleic acids control expression of messenger RNA and RNA is involved in protein synthesis and other important functions like carrying of genetic material. The research identified 109 microRNAs in an endometriosis signature, which is a combo of microRNAs that act as biological indicators for endometriosis. Basically, somebody who is well-trained in understanding this signature would be able to look at the string of microRNAs, and if it fits the signature, you would be diagnosed with endometriosis in that way. The research on this diagnostic innovation so far suggests a close to 100% accuracy of the identified signature in diagnosing endometriosis. One obvious advantage of this technology is that it provides an accessible way to get an endometriosis diagnosis that's non-invasive. If you're like me and had to go through a diagnostic laparoscopy to endometriosis, you know that this is a much better, less invasive method for diagnosing endo. Despite this incredible new technology, a few limitations are worth mentioning. The first is that 2.7% of the microRNAs were not detected and analyzed. This just means that the endo signature may not be complete and other microRNAs that have not yet been considered in the signature may also be diagnostic for endo. So it might just not be a complete signature. The second is that hormone therapy use might affect microRNA expression although other studies suggest that it doesn't. In other words, if you're on or have been on hormone therapy, it may affect the validity of this test to accurately diagnose endometriosis. The third limitation is that the study included patients with suspected but not necessarily confirmed deep infiltrating endometriosis and endometriomas. This particular test is not yet available worldwide and most clinicians are not yet familiar with how to read the results of this test or how to apply the results in practice. And the last limitation is that disease-associated microRNA signatures are known to vary with ethnicity as well. If this becomes widely available, this is an easy, non-invasive way to diagnose endometriosis. How awesome would that be? This study is the first of its kind. The study's objective was to determine whether antibiotics can relieve pain or stop endometriosis from growing. The scientists took Fusobacterium nucleatum infected tissue and transferred it into non-infected mice. This resulted in the formation of endometriotic lesions. They also stimulated the uteri of the non-Fusobacterium nucleatum infected mice with estrogen. No endo lesion formation resulted, indicating that estrogen alone was not enough to stimulate the growth of endo lesions in this model. The researchers also attempted to stimulate endometriosis growth with two different types of bacteria, lactobacillus inners and Escherichia coli. They then treated these mice with antibiotics transvaginally, which reduced the development of the endometriosis lesions, immune cell infiltration, and gene activation in these endometriotic implants. What's interesting is they also forced the expression of the TAGLN gene in tissue from donor uteri not infected with the bacterium, and this also resulted in a higher number of endometriosis lesions. This means that this TAGLN gene is essential in the process of endolesion development, whether or not the bacterium was present. Research to date does show that the TAGLN gene expression is higher in endometriosis patients, so there is an established connection here. So a couple of thoughts in response to this study. The first, 
in human endometriosis patients, Fusobacterium is found in larger amounts in the endometrium and the vaginal microbiome. The researchers transmitted Fusobacterium through the blood in their mouse model to test the theory that perhaps it originates in the mouth and moves through the blood to the uterus. This did result in endolesion development. However, the lesions were smaller than those that were established following the transfer of infected uterine tissue. In real life and in real endometriosis sufferers, we're not injected with infected tissue. Endo just happens spontaneously. Mice also don't have a menstrual cycle. This is relevant because the menstrual cycle naturally induces changes in mucus and immune cell function, which are protective against infection. The study did not show fusobacterium as a cause for endo, but highlighted that it is multifactorial and that its development is difficult to assign to a single factor. So everyone out there claiming that this could be a potential cause for endometriosis, Unfortunately, we're just not there yet. What about the established endometriosis gut connection? Many studies show a link between antibiotic use and IBS-like symptoms. Other studies have shown that reducing an already less diverse large bowel microbiome in endometriosis sufferers via antibiotic use can worsen estrogen elimination and create more immune dysfunction and inflammation. Studies have shown that endometriosis is associated with an increased presence of proteobacteria, class bacteria, Enterobacter, Streptococcus, and Escherichia coli across various microbiome sites. Other studies have shown proteobacteria and Escherichia to be more resistant against antibiotics. So in other words, by using antibiotics, which have the potential to create an imbalance in certain bacterial species already identified as being problematic for endoprogression, and in some form connected to endometriosis, we could be adding to the problem and making it worse. Other studies have shown that bacterial species like Oxalobacter and desulfovibrio had protective effects on endometriosis. So before running with the idea that antibiotics may be the answer, we need more research to investigate the effects of antibiotics on these protective species. So speaking of gut bacteria and their connection to endometriosis, Kamajani and his team found certain gut bacteria and their metabolites promoted growth of endolesions in mice. This is the third study we're talking about in this video. The research team depleted the microbiota of mice to determine the causal role of certain bacteria bacteria on endometriosis. I don't want to get too sciencey with y'all, so I'll just cut to the chase with this study. 21 days later, after depleting the microbiomes of these mice using various antibiotics and antifungals, the research team found the endolesions in the control mice to be significantly larger, fluid-filled, and vascularized, meaning they had a more prominent blood supply to these endolesions. The endolesions in the microbiome-depleted mice also had fewer immune cell infiltration and proliferative cells. This means that the immune system infiltration usually seen in endometriotic lesions, even in human studies, were not observed in the microbiome depleted mice. A few other interesting observations that they made. The first, the microbiomes of these mice had significantly less bacterioides, firmicutes, and proteobacteria. Higher amounts of proteobacteria and firmicutes have been seen in human studies in women with endometriosis. This further confirms the connection between certain classes of bacteria and endometriosis. So this is a great area to dedicate a lot of time, energy, and resources to continue to understand this connection. The team also identified a stool metabolite called quinic acid promoted the growth of human endometriotic cells in vitro. They tested this in vivo by force feeding the mice quinic acid and after 14 days found those that received the quinic acid had significantly larger endometriosis lesions than the control group. They found N-butyrate, which is a beneficial byproduct of fermentation of fiber by the keystone bacteria that colonize the human gut was shown to protect against endometriosis disease progression in their mouse model. Even though this was a mouse model, we have long had access to research on the microbiome endometriosis connection. To support a healthy microbiome, avoid unnecessary use of antibiotics, eat lots of plant foods, aim for three or more colors from plant foods with every meal, get that 30 or more grams of fiber per day, address any underlying digestive dysfunction, and consider prebiotic fiber if needed. What else might we take away from the results of this study? Perhaps the development of non-invasive diagnostic stool metabolites for endo. Imagine being able to poop in the cup for science and then get an endo diagnosis in the meantime. 
neat. Is there a new anti-inflammatory long-acting antibody for endometriosis? IL-8 or interleukin-8, a substance released by white blood cells, was observed to be heavily upregulated in endometriosis tissue and has become the target for a new anti-inflammatory antibody. Researchers tested this antibody in monkeys that had comparable levels of interleukin-8 as in human endometriosis patients. In 50% of the monkeys, which was only two out of four in the sample size, laparoscopic observations showed the size of the endolesions decreased with the use of this antibody. And after 12 months of treatment, the researchers also observed that adhesions thinned in one of the monkeys and the blood supply to endolesions in another diminished. There are a few questions and concerns over the dosing of the AMY109 antibody studied in the study, but despite the study being small, the results are profound and unlike any treatment option available to date. I, for one, am really excited about the potential for a non-hormonal treatment option for endometriosis. Vipoglanstat is another new non-hormonal drug that entered clinical trials in May 2023. This drug targets pro-inflammatory prostaglandin E2 by blocking the enzyme MPGES1. Previous studies have also shown prostaglandin E2's involvement in the formation and development of endometriosis lesions, Woohoo! to another potential non-hormonal option for managing endo. What about genetics? There was also a new research into the genetic basis of endometriosis, and this one was really fascinating. A large genome-wide association study analysis was conducted with a total sample size of over 200,000 people. Based on the review, the research team identified 42 specific loci for endometriosis. Of the 42, eight reached significance for stage three and four endometriosis, and one for endometriosis-associated infertility. The researchers also looked for genetic similarities and overlap between the genes and loci identified for endometriosis and other inflammatory or autoimmune conditions. Of the nine immune and inflammatory conditions tested, asthma had a strong positive genetic correlation. No autoimmune conditions showed significant genetic correlations with endo, which is surprising, right? Significant genetic correlations were observed between endo and excessive irregular menstruation, shorter cycle length, early age of onset of menarche, and risk of uterine fibroids. Earlier age at natural menopause and younger age at first birth were also genetically correlated with risk of endometriosis. The research team also explored the genetic overlap of endometriosis and several pain conditions. All of these pain conditions were genetically positively correlated with endometriosis, and they included migraines, headaches, multi-site chronic pain, and back pain. These were results inform a new avenue of targeted research into gene-specific mechanisms of pain and development of disease. It also informs the repurposing of existing treatment targets for endometriosis and the development of new treatment strategies. Until we can get our hands on all of these amazing new innovations and treatment options, controllable things like diet, lifestyle, and environmental exposures are still worth exploring to support improvements in your endometriosis symptoms. This is exactly what we do inside the EndoThrive Society program. I'll put the link below if you'd like to learn more. I hope to see you inside and until next time.